All right, y'all. <clears throat> Sorry. I think I've given this lecture. Like, I can't remember if we talked about housing before we left campus forever, or not forever, let's hope, um, but for this semester. But since it's been like 18 years since we left campus and had our last lecture, I can't remember. So I'm going to go ahead and record it, post it. If you've seen it, um, obviously you can skip it. But just to be safe, I figured this is an important one. So I wanted to make sure uh, it was available in case I hadn't talked about it. So we're going to talk about housing. Housing is one of those complex issues. It's a real challenge for cities. Um, as they deal with growth, as they deal with decline, all of those things affect housing availability, housing affordability, and so it can be an enormous challenge for cities to ensure that everyone has adequate and affordable housing. So, <clears throat> sorry, do, 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 do. there we go. So the activity, it's posted in um, in the module. Again, if we did this lecture, don't sweat the activity. I feel like we did, but um, I can't remember. And I'm guessing since I've said now I think we did it, y'all will just assume we did it and carry on with your lives and skip this lecture. But just in case, um, if you could do this activity, that would be great. So what causes housing issues? I'm not going to click on the link. It's to a video uh, describing some of the housing challenges communities are facing. Um, but what we're talking about when we talk about housing is really about ensuring housing diversity. We want to provide housing at a range of prices and options, both rental and purchase. Uh, we want to think about price ranges, so <clears throat> from you know, very low income housing to very you know, high end housing. We also want to think about age ranges and the changing housing needs that families have over the course of you know, a lifetime. So. Obviously, housing for young people, you know, fresh out of college or, you know, in college, multifamily options, you know, low-cost rentals that, that students can afford, um, low-cost rentals that uh, low-income people can afford. Then you want to think about, you know, new people, young people fresh out of college, starting their lives, you know, smaller homes, multifamily homes that can make sense for them. Then once they have kids, they might think about, you know, upsizing to a bigger home maybe something with a yard, a little more space. And then, you know, as the family grows, having options for, again, bigger houses and so forth. And then once, you know, the kids grow up, go off to college, maybe the, the adults at that point want to downsize and think about, you know, a smaller, going back to a multifamily option, maybe closer in, closer to the city where they can drive less. Um, and also families are changing, we're seeing more, uh, single people uh, households, single individual households. We're seeing more roommate situations. We're seeing less of you know the two income, two kid family that we're sort of used to to picturing. So that's all affecting the housing diversity that we need to think about. And we need to think about policies and support for lower cost housing at the federal, state, local levels, and strategies to provide adequate housing. So what causes housing issues? We're going to talk about rapid growth. Uh, land prices go up very quickly. Builders focus on the most profitable product, so they may not build what's needed. Uh, home prices rise quickly. Competition for available homes. Uh, lack of supply. So as communities are growing quickly, you have more people making bids on homes and um, you know, pushing the cost up pretty significantly. And investors are purchase, purchasing properties for investment or rental. So people, you know, because housing is seen as a safe investment, we see pretty significant um, investment into the housing market by people who may not have any intention of living in a particular place, but they want to purchase homes there because they see the opportunity for the value to increase and for that to be a safe place to park their money. Uh, and see it grow. So that's certainly something that affects housing availability and housing affordability. So this is an example from Buda, Texas. <clears throat> this is a community that's growing very rapidly and you can see the, the significant increase in population. So as you can imagine, because there are so many people moving to Buda, uh, land prices are going up, competition for existing houses is going up a lot of pressure on the community in terms of housing. This is an area, um, it's a suburb just south of Austin. 
And so, as you know, the Austin area is blowing up and Buda is kind of seen as one of those places where it's still affordable to get a home. So a lot of people priced out of Austin are moving to or are looking to Buda as an affordable option. And so what we see here, this is the median sales price. Um, over time, you can see how quickly it's increased from about 140000 uh, for the home price in 2010 to over 240000 in uh, 2016 when this uh, data was collected. So, you know, a $100,000 increase in the price of homes. And look at the um, income. So the orange line here is the median income. And you see that it's increasing, which is great, but it's not increasing nearly as quickly as home prices are. And so what you end up with is the affordability gap. So the difference between the increase in wages versus the increase in housing affordability starts to create this gap between what the homes cost and what people can actually afford. And if you see this sad blue line down here, that's actually incomes for the lowest earners, those making below $25,000 a year, and you can see their income has actually declined over that same period. So you can imagine folks in that boat, uh, the very low income earners are even in worse shape because their income is going down while everything else is getting more expensive. <clears throat> Uh, rental, we see a similar trend. Uh, rental prices increase dramatically. Income, you know, increases more slowly. This decline in rental prices, there was actually two big apartment complexes that opened in 2015, and that contributed to the overall decline in rental prices at that time because the, the supply increased dramatically with the two new rental properties. And part of the problem, um, of why this happens is because what's being built is single family. 90% of all units built were single family homes. The other biggest chunk were those big apartment complexes. And what's missing is duplexes, uh, townhomes, those sort of missing middle housing that can provide a lower cost option for folks um, in kind of the middle. So it's either you know single family homes that are unaffordable or living in a big apartment complex. And for families who want a different option, there's very limited supply of that. So they're kind of forced to pick one or the other. And you can look at construction costs and you can see the construction cost versus the sales price. And the difference here, um, again, it, it increases pretty dramatically over time. Um, this, the construction price goes up about $50,000 over that six year period. Sales price goes up $120,000. $8,000. So significant increase in the sales price. Um, <clears throat> part of that's due uh, to the increased price of land. So this is just the construction cost. So it doesn't include land prices. Um, so you can see part of that. And then you can see down here the breakdown of the sales price and what it actually uh, looks like. And so you can see the profit for home builders is only 9%, which is not really that excessive. We like to beat up on developers and say, oh, you know, they're just screwing people and they're making all this money. But, you know, 9% profit rate is really not that, um, is not unreasonable. You know, it's not a pro profit margin of, say, a grocery store where they're, you know, working on 2 or 3% margins, but 9% is not out of the realm of reasonable. So, you know, builders and developers are not just out there screwing people. They're actually, you know, putting out a product that's needed. Um, focusing on what the market wants. And uh, so what we see when we have um, rapid growth is that we lose housing diversity. We start to see increased prices and more cost burdened people. So the definition of cost burden is when a property owner or homeowner is paying or a renter is paying more than 30% of their income for rent. So that's the cutoff that's used to calculate uh, mortgages. That's the amount used to consider uh, this idea of being cost burden. And so you can see changes over time. Uh, gross rent went from 40, uh, about 44% of, um, oh, I'm sorry, about, uh, sorry, I completely lost my train of thought here. So the median rent 
as a percent of income is about 43.6 percent um, it went down to 39.5 percent but that still means that a lot of people are actually paying a lot for their rent um, median owner cost as a percent of income is about 21.5 went up a little bit between 2010 and 2014 and so um, what that means is you know people aren't going to be able to qualify for a mortgage that puts them over that 30 percent and that's why that number is lower than rent because no one's really doing that cost estimate for rental approvals but you can see the number of cost burden households went up significantly so in 20, 2005 to 2009 it was about 30 percent of the population was cost burdened went up to 42 percent um, in the next in the next time period and the severely cost burden are those paying more than 50 percent of, of income for rent or mortgage went up to 13.2 percent so a significant change okay so uh, we also see housing issues when we have slow growth and stagnation so there's a lack of demand for houses to be built uh, creates a challenge for economic development as there may not be appropriate or adequate housing for employees so a new business looking to relocate to a community is going to look and say well you know your community is great but there's no place for my employees to live so i'm going to look somewhere else uh, we also have issues of maintenance and blight so um, as population is declining um, or stagnating people are less likely to invest in their homes if there are vacant homes in their neighborhood the likelihood is that those homes are not being well maintained and that blight in one home you know makes the adjoining affects the adjoining property owners so those property owners may be less likely to um, maintain their homes and that blight spreads and there's a lack of housing diversity so there's fewer options for those looking to change their housing situation maybe they a couple had a kid, want a bigger house, that home's not available in their community, so they have to move to another town to get the kind of house that they want or need. Older couples looking to downsize, again, there's maybe not options for them um, in their town, so they have to look to another community. So having you know slow growth and stagnation can certainly impact housing availability and diversity. And you have um, a loss of tax base, so declining revenues, which makes it more difficult to provide services and maintain infrastructure. So you can see here, you know, lots of abandoned homes on the block. There's still one occupied home here. Um, so the, the city still needs to maintain water, wastewater, and roads, um, but there's less revenue to do so. So you can see the condition of the roads is pretty grim um, in that area. That makes it less desirable to live there and encourages people to move out if they can. And this is how quickly it can happen. So 2009, the house looks nice, well maintained. 2011, start to get overgrown, a little less maintained. The lawn's getting you know weedy. The bushes are growing up. 2013, it's boarded up. 2014, it catches on fire. You can see damage to the adjoining home as well. So if you're this property owner, you can imagine the, the issues you would have. And why would you want to maintain your home if you're living next to you know a blighted, abandoned home? And we also see actually decline in density as homes are abandoned, properties are abandoned, and cities are starting to deal with actually having to remove um, abandoned and blighted homes. <clears throat> Housing is also um, change is, is different by neighborhood. So the map here, the red dots are high sale areas, the black dots are low sale areas. So if you're in this neighborhood of Buffalo, you see Basically, if you own a home in this area, it's gonna be really hard to sell that home where other parts of Buffalo have a more active market. So even within cities, we see differences in the housing market and challenges that that can create. So federal policies also influence uh, housing affordability. So things like limits on allowable FHA loans. So FHA is the Federal Housing Administration. They uh, basically provide security for mortgages and so they're a major player in the mortgage game and their policies on allowing mortgages in different areas will influence what banks allow as well and so the FHA doesn't really allow loans in mixed-use uh, residential areas and the banks follow that policy and city policies 
um, also have an influence. So their development policies, things like large minimum lot sizes, lack of zoning for higher density multifamily homes, parking standards, all of that increases the cost of housing, makes it more difficult for developers to put out a product that's affordable. So it pushes housing to the higher end of the market, makes less housing available for lower income residents. So other market forces that influence housing affordability, builders focus on products that are easy to build and maximize profits. So again, they're really good at building single family homes on individual lots. Um, they've got that system down pat to throw those houses up. And that's, you know, that's what is easiest to build in most cities. Most cities are largely zoned for single family residential. So that's what they get, that's what gets built. Uh, you do have a competition with other uses and again because the builders are familiar with and used to building single family homes or like big multifamily residential projects big apartment complexes that's what they're familiar with and comfortable with so that's what they're going to build and you have resident attitudes and resistance so anytime you start talking about adding density or particularly if it's affordable housing um, at density neighbors lose their shit and they start to fight it every way they can. They protest, they uh, sue if they can. And because typically the folks that have the money and power um, have the influence, they can keep new housing from being built because they have the ear of the city council and the decision makers and have the, the influence to make, to get projects stopped. And the arguments you hear about crowding, traffic, crime, those kinds of things. Um, so, as we talked about, um, there is resistance from neighbors, largely because housing is seen as a pathway to wealth creation, and people purchase their homes with the expectation that those homes will increase in value. And that's a way that people build wealth in the United States, and so anything that threatens that wealth creation is going to be resisted. So there's limited resources and support in many cities for direct provision of housing. So um, for particularly for affordable housing, um, there can be limited resources to help people in need of very low cost housing. And um, one of the ways to deal with this is through broad public engagement, to really talk to people, educate them on the importance of housing diversity, help them to recognize how um, housing diversity affects economic development. You know, people are always saying, oh, we need more restaurants in town, we need more retail opportunities in town. Well, the people that work in those restaurants and those retail stores need a place to live. And um, if you keep out all lower cost housing options, you're not gonna have a place for the retail workers to live in your town, and it's gonna make it harder for businesses to be successful. So that's one kind of leverage point uh, you can use to try and encourage people to support more housing diversity. And your business owners can be a resource in that. The LA Times story here actually talks about how lack of housing is affecting job growth in California and businesses are choosing to uh, locate their businesses elsewhere or even leave California because the costs have gotten so high uh, in California and it's so difficult to build new housing. So people are, are actually choosing to leave the area because they can't find appropriate housing. So shifting gears a little bit to sustainability. Um, <laughs> Social sustainability, this is, I love this picture because, you know, it's you know, love is love, all lives matter, nice progressive sign that you see in people's yards, yet here they are opposing a mixed use multifamily development. This is the attitude that you have in a lot of cities that, you know, we want to have, you know, we love everyone, we're super progressive, we're super liberal, and yet we don't want any kind of multifamily in our neighborhood because that's bad those people are not welcome here, right? All love is love, all people matter, except for people that live in apartments, they don't matter at all. So uh, you wanna use your zoning code to promote density, to um, allow for higher density in multifamily in appropriate areas. So looking at your community, using your future land use plan to identify areas where uh, multifamily is appropriate, making sure you have adequate land zoned for that use and um, allowing it to be developed. Um, 
build density and proximity to transit and other services because that can help reduce the cost of transportation for folks if you allow um, you know, multifamily, particularly in proximity to transit, people can have the option to not own a car potentially, and that leaves a lot of money in their pockets. Or maybe, you know, a couple can own one car instead of two because one spouse can drive to work, the other can take transit, depending on you know where the jobs are located. So, certainly having access to transit is important, and density makes transit more effective and more efficient. So the, the more we can increase density, the more we can actually provide efficient transit and reduce automobiles, which has lots of knock-on costs that we've talked about. <clears throat> so you also wanna look at mixed-use development opportunities. So um, putting development in areas already served by infrastructure, redeveloping, old like shopping malls, big suburban shopping malls that have shut down are targets for redevelopment being turned into mixed use developments. Um, the housing development costs are subsidized by the retail commercial uses, which is good, um, helps bring down the cost of that housing. And uh, one of the challenges though, is that most mixed use being built today is not affordable. We're seeing a lot of luxury mixed use being built, sort of higher end developments with higher end retail. But as this product becomes more accepted and more acceptable, and as some of these you know, high-end units age, they will kind of trickle down and become more affordable over time. So, um, you know, this is still relatively new, but as it becomes more popular um, and more common, it'll become more affordable as well. And we've talked about FHA mortgage policies and the challenge that can create. So accessory dwelling units, are an option where basically you add like a granny flat or a garage apartment to a single family home. The nice thing about these, because they tend to be relatively small, is that they offer a low cost rental option. Um, it also creates an opportunity for families to, you know, have granny live in the granny flat. Um, so she has some independence, has her own kitchen, has her own entrance. Um, but is still there close to the family for necessary support. And another benefit is that the homeowner has that income if they're renting out the, the accessory dwelling unit. They have that income that can help offset their mortgage and make their home more affordable. So you get kind of a double whammy of affordability with um, the mortgage being subsidized by the rental unit and a low cost rental unit available for uh, people who need that. And it's, it's kind of a way to incorporate density into existing neighborhoods and existing development. So again, you're getting the benefit of putting more people where you already have water and wastewater lines and roads, um, and you can do it in a gentle way that doesn't really change the character of the neighborhood. So minimum units per acre, um, most zonings based on maximum allowable units per acre. So we say you can build up to eight units per acre on a particular lot. Minimum units per acre would say you have to build at least eight units per acre on this lot. And so, you know, if it's a maximum, then builders can build less than that and provide fewer homes. Uh, with minimum units per acre, you're requiring the developer to maximize the use of every lot and put at least you know, eight units per acre, whatever the number is, to ensure maximum development and maximum use of the space. So it's a way to increase development um, by, by maximizing land use. Reducing parking requirements. Um, parking spaces are expensive and they can add a significant amount to uh, the cost of new housing, particularly in like multifamily. If you require one or two spaces per unit, you end up with you know, ginormous parking lots serving your apartments, which is a huge cost for developers, as well as just creating more impervious services and more cost for maintenance down the lines. So if you can build, you know, reduce your overall parking requirements, build in transit, uh, in proximity to transit, um, all those things can help reduce costs. So, when we start shifting gears to below market rate housing, so like actually subsidized housing for very low income families, we want to think about um, acquiring land for redevelopment. So in this case, maybe the city uh, spends the money to buy the land, takes that cost burden off of a potential developer, gives the land to a developer who agrees to build affordable housing. 
uh, land trusts and community development corporations are nonprofit organizations focused on building housing, and so they can be a, a way to provide low cost housing for communities as well. Habitat for Humanity is a great one. So um, again, they're a resource to build low cost housing that actually empowers the family by including them in the construction of the home. So uh, to do this, you want to create an inventory of properties that have tax liens or foreclosures, you know, make those available, um, acquire them, <clears throat> working with your other taxing entities, um, then make those available to somebody who can build the homes on them. This does take a while. Uh, property acquisition can be very time consuming. Um, it does mean you're foregoing uh, the money owed to the city because the taxes that you're, you know, because the taxes haven't been paid, you're going to foreclose on the property, take ownership of it, means you're not gonna actually collect that tax money. But what you're doing is you're taking an abandoned property that's a blight on the community and turning it into, you know, a nice home for somebody. So there is um, a benefit to it, even though it comes at a cost and can take a while. So the way land trusts and community development corporations work, um, there's a few different ways to do that. So one example is that the community development corporation or the land trust will purchase the property and build the homes and then they sell the homes to buyers, but the land trust or corporation owns the land. So you separate the land value from the value of the home. So that allows the buyer to pay a much lower cost because they're not actually purchasing the land then as the property increases in value over time, when the property owner or the, the homeowner, sorry, I've got to differentiate those things. When the homeowner sells the home, they get the increased value of the home itself, but not the increased value of the land. So that allows the land to um, you know, stay in ownership of the corporation. The, the homeowner benefits from the increased value of the home itself, but it's still a much lower cost when they sell it than it otherwise would be because they're not selling the land and the increased value of the land as well. So it allows that home to stay affordable over time, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so low income housing tax credit projects are a way to encourage private developers to in include low-income units in their developments. So, um, you know, a developer will say, I will include 20% affordable units in my, uh, this apartment complex I'm building. It's a 100 unit complex. So 20 units will be set aside for affordable renters and they get federal tax credits for doing that. It's a very complex, kind of a difficult process to go through. Um, but it is an effective way of providing affordable housing. And the benefit is that that affordable housing is in those, um, isn't segregated and put aside in its own area where you're concentrating poverty into you know, low income areas. It's actually mixed with the market rate units and you get the benefits of having those mixed income neighborhoods. So section eight program, is basically a voucher program that allows uh, low-income renters below 50% of area median income to pay no more than 30% of their income for housing. They get vouchers for that. So this is a federal program administered through local public housing authorities at the local level. Um, those vouchers allow renters more flexibility in where they choose to live so they can live in proximity to jobs better schools, whatever, and they just have a cap on what they pay for rent and the voucher makes up the rest. Uh, program is, is a great opportunity for families. However, not all landlords have to um, accept vouchers. So many landlords are discriminatory against those with the Section 8 vouchers. Some cities and states have laws against uh, discrimination for using vouchers, but not every state does. Um, Additionally, those vouchers are very hard to come by. Here in River Falls, the waiting list for vouchers has been closed since 2016. So there's so many people requesting uh, that assistance that you can't even get on the waiting list for it. So um, not enough money to fund the need, but the voucher program can be super effective for those who do receive the vouchers.
and actual public housing is when a public housing authority builds and operates and manages the units again that's for very very low income uh, families seniors so forth i'm not going to click on the links um, but there are you know everything from family units up to senior facilities are provided there as well so some other housing issues to talk about home maintenance and upkeep there is funding available for that there are some state and federal grants that can be used to fund home maintenance um, just to improve quality of life and reduce blight in neighborhoods. Volunteer programs and partnerships like Plano's Love Where You Live um, is a city intervention program where they bring the city organizes like a big intensive weekend of activity. They bring in volunteer groups. They work with lo local businesses to get supplies and equipment donated. They go into a neighborhood and they do things like ba basic home maintenance, yard cleanups, neighborhood you know trash pickups all of those things to help improve uh, the appearance uh, and safety of that neighborhood and then at the end of it they have a big block party and the intention of that program is to one address sort of the first signs of blight in these neighborhoods so instead of waiting till the neighborhood is significantly blighted and on the decline they intervene early to catch those things before they become a problem they help homeowners with those basic um, maintenance and upkeep issues that can sometimes overwhelm low-income and elderly people and they're creating a spirit of cohesion and neighbor neighborliness through the party and through getting you know neighbors involved in volunteering and they help build social capital in that neighborhood to help maintain the improvements that are made over the course of that weekend so it's a pretty cool uh, project pretty cool way to um, you know address housing issues in a positive way as opposed to just beating people up through the code enforcement process. Mobile homes, manufactured homes can be a, a low cost affordable option for people. Uh, many cities are very resistant to allowing affordable homes um, in their community, but it can be, again, the, the quality of them has gone up significantly. They look like regular homes now. They provide you know, they're really well built, they provide good shelter, and uh, they can be an option for folks. Uh, there are some issues with them, but um, you definitely want to consider that as a option for housing in your community. So some trends that we need to deal with senior housing. Um, we have an aging population, people are living longer, living more independently longer, so we need to provide options for uh, senior living. Uh, we want to this idea of short-term rentals is becoming a huge challenge, particularly in like resort communities and you know, beach communities, places like that, where um, homes are being bought up by investors to use as short-term rentals. So again, no intention of ever living there, but they're using it as an income stream from short-term rentals. So that can drive the price of homes up and reduce the availability of homes for actual permanent residents. So we're seeing a lot of cities regulate short-term rentals and put in place policies to restrict uh, how they get used. Location efficient mortgages are a way to actually include transportation costs in the calculation of a mortgage. So um, when we talk about um, transportation costs, they can oftentimes be almost as much as a mortgage with what people are paying as they, you know, they, they get farther and farther away from their jobs in order to find housing they can afford. And so they might have a rent or a mortgage payment that they can afford, but they're paying so much in transportation that they actually are ending up paying more than they otherwise would if they live closer to their employer or whatever. So uh, there are some banks that are looking at this idea of location efficient mortgages and actually allowing people to qualify for a higher payment than they otherwise would if they can show that by living in this home, um, you know, it's on a transit stop, so I don't have to own a car, or my family will own one car instead of two cars, then that amount of money that would otherwise get spent on paying for a car can be calculated as part of their mortgage, and you can qualify to purchase a more expensive home. So it's a pretty clever idea um, because people are looking for mortgages they can afford and end up because if you're not thinking about transportation costs, then you might end up actually upside down um, in what you would pay um, for a more expensive home because you're paying so much more for transportation. Hopefully that makes sense. 
So the environmental impacts of housing, residential buildings are about 20% of all energy consumption. We spend about $2,000 per year on energy bills. Most of that is heating and cooling. About 20% of CO2 emissions, about 100 gallons of water per day. Uh, leaky toilet can waste 200 gallons per day, so pretty significant water demands. And most of our residential water consumption is outdoor irrigation. So we're using a lot of water to, to water the lawn as opposed to actually drinking it, bathing in it, cooking with it, whatever. So homes are getting bigger. And so when we have bigger homes, we're using more uh, energy to heat and cool them, light them, all those things. They also have more maintenance, higher construction costs. You can see even as families have gotten smaller. So uh, we've gone from um, almost you know three people per family down to just over two and a half people for families per family even as home size has increased dramatically so we're building bigger homes and um, with smaller families we're also uh, putting more stuff in storage so self-storage is an exploding business lots of opportunity there people have these giant homes they're full of crap their garages are full of crap and their expensive cars are sitting on their driveways and they're also paying rent on the storage unit because we have so much stuff improving efficiency in home construction is a major opportunity to reduce environmental impacts uh, retrofitting older homes can be more environmentally efficient than actually building new homes so investing in maintenance and upkeep and improvements to existing homes has a smaller footprint than building something new and passive design allows natural heating and cooling, reduces heat from sunlight, so forth. So landscaping is a big part of um, efficiency. So if we use xeriscaping, native plants that reduce water demand, reduce uh, pesticide, herbicide, fertilizer use, all of that's a definite positive impact. And um, our urbanized space has increased at twice the rate of population growth. We're, we're sprawling, suburban sprawl is an enormous challenge. As we build bigger homes farther and farther away from our employment centers, we're eating up more agricultural lands, more habitat, creating more impervious services, having an enormous environmental impact, um, increasing air pollution from traffic. You know, all of these issues are driven by our sprawling land use patterns. So if we can build more compactly, build more density, we can be more efficient, both environmentally and financially. That's it.